Good morning. I'm going to talk about meniscus tears and take a case-based approach. This was supposed to be for the UCSF senior residents, but I think it's probably pretty practical for all residents at all levels. In order to do this, we're going to do a quick review of the basics of meniscus tears and then do some case presentations, discuss the different option of treatment for these patients, the biomechanics of meniscus tears in each different, different setting, and talk a little bit about the clinical outcomes. So I think the basics that everyone needs to know about meniscus tears are the vasculature of the meniscus and the role of the meniscus in force transmission. The most important thing and the thing that gets tested the most is the blood supply of the meniscus. And this was studied by Steve Arnosky and Russ Warren and published many, many years ago in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. And this figure is pretty famous. And it, basically what it shows is that you have a red, red zone where the peripheral capsular blood supply, which comes from the middle geniculate, supplies the inner third to the meniscus at best. The red-white zone is kind of this area with which has a little bit of a blood supply. And then the inner two-thirds is the white-white zone, which has very little blood supply. Now, the role of the meniscus is to transmit force, and it does this by increasing the congruency, which results in decreased point loading to the cartilage. It also absorbs shock due to the increased elasticity of the meniscus. Um, importantly, it relieves 50% of the shock and extension, but as we'll see with a lot of these meniscus tear studies, biomechanically, it is more important in flexion, especially from 60 to 90 degrees. The secondary role of the meniscus is stability. The medial meniscus is the primary restraint to the ACL deficient knee for the tibia to slide forward, and importantly, the lateral meniscus moves twice as much as the medial meniscus with knee range of motion. I'm not going to talk too much about physical exam of the meniscus, but there are a variety of different tests. I think that the most important one is joint line tenderness. This is the most specific for meniscus tears. The Thessaly test is the most sensitive. I personally don't like McMurray's. Um, I think the modified Apley and squat test where you have a patient squat down are great for posterior horn meniscus tears. When we look at tear types, I think both these pictures depict these types of tears pretty well. Um, the most common type we see in an ACL tear is a vertical longitudinal tear, which is seen here. A radial tear is uh, similar to a root tear is the one with the most biomechanical consequences. A horizontal tear is usually a pretty stable tear pattern until um, the, in, the inferior leaflet um, flips out and starts becoming unstable. An oblique or parrot beak tear is usually a part of a complex or degenerative tear condition. Now, when we consider patients who undergo meniscus surgery, uh, all of these factors is, are, are associated with worse outcomes, including higher BMI, smoking, diabetes, the presence of arthritis, poor overall alignment, workers' comp, and a higher initial patient-reported outcome score, meaning if you're not suffering early on, it's probably not bothering you enough to have surgery. Now, I'm not going to talk about these too much today, but it's important to remember that the bucket handle meniscus tear will often show up on MRI as a double PCL sign or a double anterior meniscus sign. It's often a sign of ACL instability, so if you have a bucket handle tear, examine the ACL carefully and look on your MRI for any ACL problems, especially in the setting of previous ACL reconstruction. And in pretty much all cases, you're going to try to repair it. Um, it's usually fixable at the time of ACL reconstruction. Uh, the second thing we're not going to cover much because I think it belongs more in an early OA talk is the management of a degenerative meniscus tear. Um, the important thing to remember is that placebo seems to work as well as surgery. Surgery has minimal benefit after six months, so it's a short-term fix. And if you're taking your board exam anytime soon, I would not recommend um, taking a patient to surgery with a clearly degenerative meniscus tear. So we kind of already covered this, but I think it's important to highlight again, uh, most studies suggest no long-term improvement when you have a degenerative meniscus tear. All right, so let's transition into cases. Um, with, I can't necessarily show these videos, 
but the first patient is an 18 year old male linebacker who comes into clinic and says he heard a pop while playing had inability to bear weight and had difficulty with range of motion he comes in on crutches and he's fairly swollen now when we look at these representative cuts of the MRI, first of all, the thing that sounds like is it sounds like an ACL and he has lateral sided pain. And this is a good example of one where you really have to think, I should ask about mechanism, but I don't want to guarantee that a pop is going to be an ACL, especially in the setting of a football game where there's lots of sounds going on. When I look at this MRI, I see essentially what looks like a ghost meniscus here, absence of meniscus here, and on the axial, we can see the, a radial tear here. So this is a radial meniscus tear, okay? And just to highlight that, you can see this tear right here where you can kind of see it's, this is the anterior part, this is the posterior part. So this guy was hit on the outside of his knee, collapsed down, tore his meniscus. Um, you can see that here as well, where you see the meniscus tear here where there's a gap for the radial tear, and then you're seeing right th in this cut here, there's missing meniscus because this um, coronal section corresponds to this cut right through here. Now we know from a variety of different biomechanical studies that a radial tear is important, but I thought this recent study in KSSTA um, was interesting because it shows that the location of the root tear shows a relative importance and, and essentially the closer you are to the posterior root, the more biomechanical consequences there are, especially in flexion. And that's what they essentially showed here. They showed a group M, which is the mid portion, group P, posterior portion, and group R, root tear, and they these show the different um, tear configurations intact, M, P, and R. And as you increase your flexion angle, overall, um, the group with the post posterior root tear especially um, had the highest peak contact pressures. So it's biomechanically worse the closer you get to the root. Now their explanation for this I thought was interesting um, and is shown in this diagram as you go into deep flexion in these mid-portion tears, you can still transmit some of the force posteriorly. As you get a little bit more posterior, there's less force. And then with this posterior root tear, essentially you have no force through this part. So the overall peak contact force areas when you're, way f when you're much further back in deep flexion is gonna have the highest biomechanical consequences. When we look at the clinical outcomes of these tears, what we find is that there aren't that many studies. And these two studies, I think, highlight the outcomes, which probably don't give a perfect story, but are reasonable outcomes to talk to patients with. Um, this study by Aaron Critch's group in AJSM in 2018 did a propensity matched analysis of bucket handle and radial tears. Um, what they found was in overall small groups that both the radial and bucket handle meniscus repairs achieved their postoperative Tegner scores that were not different from their pre-injury level. So they essentially were able to go back to the same level of sports. Um, their operation free reoperation survival rates were pretty good. They were not significantly different and were at about 77% at five years and 87% for radial and bucket handle groups. Um, both, both of them, when they had successful repairs, were able to return to a normal patient-reported outcomes. Um, this systematic review by um, Dr. Laprade's group looked at six studies with 55 patients, a variety of different repair strategies. Um, they found good overall outcomes, but overall it's a small series and limited follow-up. And I think part of the problem is, is oftentimes when we get these radial tears, um, we end up just debriding them, and we're not too excited about writing these studies up. Um, or these patients up because we know that a lot of these patients essentially have a subtotal mastectomy. So we're not really capturing how a lot of these patients are doing. All right, so transitioning to the second case. Second case is a 40 year old male, 44 year old male with a history of pain and swelling in his left knee. He had a history of a root repair in the right knee and overall had been doing well on that side. And he comes in with a couple week history of increasing pain 
on the left knee. And he said he had a little bit of swelling and this had happened after running. So the things that concern me about this person is he's a relatively young person, he's not overweight, and he already had a root tear and repair on the other side. Um, he's also, when he comes in, he um, comes in with this MRI and he has these rather interesting constellation of findings. Um, without the video, um, these are just representative images, but what this shows is this bruising right at the posterior root some changes in the posterior root. And again, you can see this bruising and you can't really see it on this imaging as well, uh, all that well, but he had a little bit of degenerative change in the cartilage just adjacent to this root. So in these patients, it's a little bit complicated what to do. Um, he doesn't really have a root tear, but he clearly is symptomatic. And I thought this study was uh, really interesting. It came out about seven years ago now. And what they found was that the posterior horn medial meniscus root tear actually had a prequel where a majority of um, patients with a um, subsequent root tear demonstrated this subcortical marrow edema, just like our patient had. And you can see that in this image right there. You can see that image here um, where you can see this edema right here. Here, this patient doesn't really have any extrusion yet, but later on, the patient seems to have more extrusion. Now, this patient comes back about six months later after hearing a um, pop and having increasing pain, and you can see then that they've torn the um, meniscus root. They have the classic ghost sign, um, and you can see that he's now extruded and has increasing changes in the um, femoral condyle. So as you can see by this graph in the top right, we've had a rapid increase in our understanding of root tears over the last 15 years. Um, the first study by Chris Harner's group looked at the biomechanical consequences of a tear at the posterior root of the medial meniscus, and importantly, they found that this was to similar to total meniscectomy. And this, show, this just shows a graph of this where it shows intact root repair, posterior horn tear, and meniscectomy. So essentially when you take out the meniscus, it's the same as having a root tear on the contact area and uh, contact pressure. Um, not surprisingly, several studies have subsequently shown that when you have a root tear, you have arthritis progression on serial MRIs following um, the diagnosis of medial meniscus. So this does seem to be one of those times where we can potentially intervene in patients and prevent the rapid progression of arthritis. So here is his, his, his root tear, and then we do a luggage tag through and then pass sutures at, through a drill hole and reattach that. Now, overall, the outcomes of these are really pretty good. Um, this was a nice recent study in OJSM, um, and this systematic review shows that root tears over here function a lot better. Um, they have a higher activity level compared to um, meniscectomy. Their Tegner scores are higher, and the arthritis scores and reoperation rates are much higher in patients who undergo meniscectomy versus uh, root repair. So when we know that root tears are pretty bad. The biomechanical consequences are OA progression. Root repair works pretty well. The problem is we don't yet know when it's too far gone, like how aggressive we should be in those patients with moderate arthritis. So moving on to probably our most common case, this is a 57-year-old, we'll just call him a Stanford professor because Stanford is awesome. He's had about six months of knee pain. He says the pain is mostly medial. He has pain with movements, including golf and tennis, so kind of those Thessaly-like movements. He has normal x-rays, and he comes in with these degenerative tear signs. So he's got a little bit of a complex tear here where we can see the medial meniscus doesn't look perfect. And then when we look on the coronal T2, we see that he's got a horizontal meniscus tear. So we have a variety of different treatment options. Oh, we can talk about leaving it alone and say, hey, m many of these patients are just gonna do okay if we don't do anything to their meniscus. We can try to repair it and be very aggressive, or we can try to debreed it, which brings up the question of how we would best debreed it. So looking first at how we would want to debreed this, I think this was a really nice study. 
um, that looks at the contact mechanics with people with horizontal cleavage tears and resection of different parts of the meniscus. Now this study is really actually quite challenging to do because to make a horizontal tear in an intact knee and then to breed it without uh, messing up the biomechanical forces across the knee is really quite challenging. Um, so this was, a, I think, a really nice study um, to go back and read and look at their uh, techniques in the methods section. Um, what you see in this graph and what's seen in the tech scan is they tested at zero and 60 degrees. You have intact um, horizontal tears. So even with the horizontal tear, the contact forces go up just a little bit, it looks like. Um, when you do a repair, it essentially goes back down to normal. When you do an inferior leaflet resection versus a superior and inferior uh, resection, um, you see differences. So importantly, the differences are greater at 60 degrees than at zero degrees, and they seem to be greatest when you cut the superior leaflet. So when you cut, take out the superior leaflet, it tends to be more important than if you take out the inferior leaflet. Um, we don't know exactly why that is, and again, this isn't probably perfect in, in a clinical scenario, but in general, what this study has taught me that is that I'm gonna try to debride that inferior leaflet a little bit more than the superior leaflet when possible. Now this was a study that we did a while back um, looking at cartilage MRI relaxation times after partial meniscectomy. Um, and what we wanted to look at was this area right adjacent to where they had the meniscus tear. And what we found interestingly was there wasn't really much of a difference when we looked at T1 row relaxation times pre-op and six months post-op. So suggesting that even with that resection, the cartilage changes didn't really change all that much afterwards. So I think this study suggests that if you're going to do a partial meniscectomy, it's probably reasonable to say that, at least in the short term, you're not really causing cartilage changes. So the biomechanical consequences are probably more due to the tear and not our surgery. So what about how patients do? Now, I think this study, um, along with a variety of the other studies that have come out from the um, Rush group are really interesting, and they look at taking their a variety of different surgeries and looking at when patients um, reach their minimal clinically important difference, their patient acceptable symptomatic state, and their substantial clinical benefits. And so for this study, they looked at a variety of different time points, but importantly, they didn't really look until 180 days. And then they looked at IKDC and CUS scores, but they also looked at um, symptoms, pain, ADLs, sport, and quality of life. And what they found was that a majority of patients reached a minimally clinically important difference after meniscectomy. And if you look at that, this, this bar over here, where you see most of them by 180 days, they have a, about an 80% chance of reaching that. But when you get to about nine months, most of them have reached that. So about 90% have reached MCID overall. Um, the patient acceptable symptomatic state, may, meaning the patient feels good. Um, it's interesting, tends to be a little bit lower. Importantly, pain does not, re only less than half seem to reach that. So in all patients, you may have a less likely chance that patients are gonna say they feel good. They'll say they feel better. Most of them are gonna feel better, but they may not necessarily feel good, which is, I think, important to let patients know. Now, what about clinical outcomes? Um, despite the fact that we do a lot of these surgeries, there's not a ton of really well done studies. Um, this was a nice systematic review. They looked at 19, patient, 19 studies with almost 300 patients. Overall, 93% returned to sports. About 75% said they were symptom free. Overall, the patient reported outcomes were good. 12% reoperation rate. So that's what I tell patients is you've got about a one in 10 chance that we're gonna wanna reoperate you, on you at some point. Um, there was not this nice um, editorial commentary um, that does say we need better research. And I think this definitely points us out. We don't have the amount of data that we would really like for patients to tease out which of these patients we should operate on. Okay, so what about non-operative management? So when we look at partial meniscectomy of these patients versus placebo, we know in degenerative tears, 
that's what these graphs look like. But this study out of Finland showed that with 146 patients without any evidence of arthritis, but with a meniscus tear, so these are horizontal or complex type tears, relatively younger age group, age 35 to 65, they found no difference in outcomes with arthroscopic partial meniscectomy versus placebo. And the primary outcome was a WOMET score, which you see here, basically, both placebo surgery and meniscectomy get better and they stay better. Same with lysome, pain with exercise improves as well. So thank you, Finland, for at least showing us at two years that the patients do no better with surgery or sham surgery. They also went and did a five-year study and for better or for worse, showed essentially the exact same thing. So these are their graphs in their fidelity trial. And they show that, you know, first we saw the graph to two years, now we're seeing at three years, four years, five years. So at least in Finland, um, when you have a um, degenerative meniscus tear, you do just as well with non-operative and operative management. So what did we do for this patient? Um, well, obviously, since this is America, we debrided them, so this patient elected to undergo surgery. What we found was this flap, so I think when these horizontal tears become symptomatic, it's because this flap kind of ends up extruding out, so, and it ends up catching. So we clean that up. You can see the cartilage largely looks good. Um, I really try to focus on getting this undersurface part and leaving as much of the superior leaflet as possible. And I try to really stay off the cartilage. So when I'm doing this surgery as a technical pearl, when I'm trying to do the debridement, I try to push the meniscus off the cartilage so that when I'm using something that could beat up the cartilage, I'm really off the edge here. So in summary, I think the most important um, uh, basic science part of the meniscus is to remember the blood supply. So the peripheral um, 15 to 20% is the red red zone. The next 15% is the red white zone. That's the area where you have a blood supply for healing. The inner third, inner two thirds is the white white zone. This just generally is not going to heal. Understand that root tears are bad. Um, we want to be aggressive about fixing them. And, and the next step for root tears is figure it out at which point we should just say that this is the normal wear and tear pattern versus this is a point in time where we should be intervening in patients. And don't overtreat patients with meniscus tears, especially if you are a younger surgeon or in your board collection. This data suggests that non-operative management of meniscus tears, at least to start, is 100% reasonable. So hopefully this helps. Thank you very much.